said, you don't believe in fake it till you make it. I hate fake it till you make it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in this men's group, you know, we were talking about earlier. Yeah. There's like lies that people tell themselves. One of those is fake it till you make it. And really to shorten my, my answer to that is you need to find mentors when you're young. That's the time to learn. That's the time to grow. It's not the time to, you know, make a million bucks and buy a line bikini and look like a man. Right. Wherever you guys are watching this show, I would truly appreciate it if you follow or subscribe. It helps a lot with the algorithm. It helps us get bigger and better guests, and it helps us grow the team. It truly means a lot. Thank you guys for supporting, and here's the episode. All right, guys. Fellow podcast host here today, Mark McCormack, all the way from Utah. Not too far. How's it going? Good, man. Really good. Uh, we share some, uh, some common goals, I think. You and uh, some common investments. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we do. For now. I know you got a $30 million fund, right? Yep. I'd love to hear about how you got into that space and what, what the goal with the fund is. Yeah, absolutely. So um, so that fund is it's Tandem Ventures out of Utah. So it was started by Alex Bean and McKay Dunn. And there, Alex is one of the guys that uh, started uh, Divi. And so oh, Divi I, sold to Bills.com. What does Divi do? Up. I've heard of that. They're an accounting software. Okay. So it's one of the biggest unicorns out of Utah, if not the biggest one. So wow. Divi sold for like $2.6 billion. Damn. After four years. That's yeah. a good partner to have. Yeah, so they're, <laughs> so they're the managing partners. I'm one of the venture partners. So I really just raise money for them and, and you know, go over like deal flow and stuff like that. Nice. How long you been doing that? I've been in the investment space for probably about 13 years. Okay. So, But I've been with Tandem since uh, September. And I, I first started just investing with them, my own money. And then, yeah. and then you know, it's kind of a natural progression into it. So is it true the VC space, it's like, what, 10% of the investments pay off or something low like that? Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, it really ranges. Got so it. you're kind of, I call it placing bets, you know, you bring in as many companies as you can, underwrite them the best that you can, you know, mostly medium risk, high reward. And so right. we're really trying to basically three to five X every deal, you know, in about three to five years. Really. Nice. And so, but when you seed, so that, you know, with the different rounds, when you seed in, there's a lot of deals, you know, you can get 50 X, 100 X. And so, yeah, it kind of makes up some of the, some of the ones that go down. Wow. Any big exits so far? No. So that, that fund has only been around for about 18 months. Oh, got it. So we're, we're just kind of loading right now. We did that first round of 30 mil. Um, we're doing the next 20 million right now to close that fund, go mm -hmm. 50 million on that. And we do, let's see, I think we've got about seven S SPVs. Wow. What is that? So that's when you just do a specific raise for one specific company. Got so it. Instead of a pot of funds. Got it. I just had on, I forget his name, but he did the uh, fundraising for Top Golf. He was on yesterday. Oh, okay, cool. That was a while said, ago. Yeah. yeah, he said it was the best investment he ever made. Oh, cool. He actually didn't have any personal money. He raised it all for them. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. So he <laughs> just basically does what you do. Yeah. The cool thing with our fund, so we, um, so number one, all the partners, we represent ten percent of all the money going in. So every deal that I raise, I have my own personal oh, wow. money in, and then we don't pay any carried interest forward or any of the upside for people unless we double their money. Interesting. So, yeah, we're because all of us are pretty wealthy guys that are, that are partners. You know, like Jimmer for that's one of the partners. Also, oh, nice. yeah, we've got some got some heavy hitters in there, so it's really fun. Wow, I want to talk about how you got to uh, to that stage of your life where you had money like that. So yeah. prior to this, what were you doing? So my my dad's a Scottish immigrant, so came over and when I was three years old, he started an athletic equipment company called ADP Lemco, mm -hmm. and so out of Utah. And so we make basketball backstop, gin divider curtains, we do bleachers, all sorts of stuff inside of new construction education market. So subcontractor eventually. Got it. And so I ended up buying that company from him, um, worked there my whole life. I started working when I was eight years old. He so. didn't give you it? You bought it? I bought it, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we kind of talked about that back and forth. And I, I, to me, it was just a much better transition to, um, to sell it and, or to buy it from him. And the reason why is because one day I'll eventually sell it. Got it. And so I don't want to have you know, an annuity basically attached to it forever. Oh, interesting. That makes sense. Yeah. I never thought a uh, business like that could be generating that much money. We do well, yeah. We're in about thirty-five <laughs> states, yeah. Damn. So, and I also saw you did the flooring for the NBA and the NCA. Is that a different company? That's a totally separate company called Professional Floor Systems. And wow. So I bought into that company. I think about four or five years ago. Started with a real estate transaction. I, I the guy that owned, well, the guy that was in that industry came to me and wanted a loan uh, and partnership into buying a commercial building that they were in. And then mm. we eventually started flipping wood floors. And I love the business, so I got into it. So now we represent a lot of NBA teams. We're getting into the NCAA really tight. And nice. It's actually the reason I'm in Vegas right now. I, I bought another company called Artsman Sports. It's kind of, you'll see a pattern here. but Okay. Um, and we do uh, memorabilia for the NBA. We have a license with the NBA. And so mm. we're actually branching into the NFL, into uh, soccer worldwide. And they're at a trade show right now. So 
That's where I'm going after this. Damn, so you got a, you wear a lot of hats. I do, man. I get I get my fingers on a lot of stuff. <laughs> a lot of these companies are all I have really good general. Shout out to the Science of Scaling podcast hosted by Mark Roberge. It's brought to you by the HubSpot Podcast Network, the audio destination for business professionals. Each week, Mark, founding CRO at HubSpot CRO and senior lecturer at Harvard Business School, interviews some of the most successful sales leaders in tech to learn the secrets, strategies, and tactics to scaling company growth. We recently had on the head of sales from OpenAI, and that was a very interesting episode on the future of AI. Listen to the science of scaling wherever you get your podcast today. Really good general managers, really, really good employees. Yeah. So I, I'm able to kind of go around and, you know, do, I don't know the word for it is big level stuff, you know, meet right, right. people kind of do like, you know, long-term deals that take nine months to a year to kind of come to fruition. Mm. And are you the one hire, making these important hires or you got a team for that too? Uh, I don't do a lot of the hiring anymore, um, but like acquisitions, absolutely, I do all of them. I do all my own underwriting, and it's all my own money too. Wow, so like, yeah, you rarely see that. I feel like with people in your shoes, where it's yeah. their own money. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, I'm, I'm 42 currently, and so a lot of my career was just kind of putting my head down and building the business and growing state to state and growing dealer networks and all this kind of stuff. And then the last few years, I've kind of realized I'm a little bit of a unicorn in the space. I kind of figured most business owners would go buy verticals and stuff like that. But yeah, yeah. Sounds like you've really got that balance of just passion and, and making money, which is rare. Yeah, yeah, it's fun. I, I've kind of, uh, yeah, I just got to the point where I just want to spread my wings, but like in a very systematic way that I like. Right. And so, so you don't deal with any stresses, anxieties. You've kind of mitigated most of it. Yeah, I don't have a lot of anxiety. I'm pretty, I'm pretty confident. You know, I've got a good amount of money personally. You know, and so it's easy for me to like look at something and go and buy it. And when you use your own money, you don't. There's not as much stress behind that right you don't have investors that are you know knocking on your door wondering what's going on mm. you know none of my companies are publicly traded so it's you know all the accounting's done in-house and all that kind of stuff so. i see a lot of my friends are going the public route actually yeah are they going through spacs or are they going it, usually spacs yeah yeah and it yeah. usually doesn't work out <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, good luck yeah i think I, that's all a finance thing right it just depends on how you're going to finance your business and, and bring money in yeah but then you got to perform, right? I mean, that's the big thing with a SPAC. If you don't perform, the market will beat exactly. your ass, basically. Yeah. yeah, I sold one of my companies, and part of the deal was a stock that was part of a SPAC, and yeah. I thought I was going to be loaded. Stock never happened, and yeah, yeah learning lesson, right? Yeah. Not yeah. to sell just for stock. See, and I would, my companies, two of them I'm trying to prep, actually, for an exit to, um, to a publicly traded company. Mm. And so when I do, I actually like getting the stock because then it's a non-taxable event. Mm. Right? So you're not getting beat down with taxes. But I'm, I'm looking more like, mid-level companies you know they're like doing two billion a year right like this was a brand new company and it wasn't established yeah so, yeah, yeah. There's, risk. there's risks there you think you just if you can make it happen you can make it happen yeah you had an interesting take on your instagram you said you don't believe in fake it till you make it i hate fake it till you make it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i really do there, there's a couple i i'm kind of doing this series i'm in i'm in this men's group you know we were talking about earlier yeah. and there's a lot of guys in there i'm, I'm a little bit i'm one of the leaders in there and so when i'm kind of mentoring some of the guys i there's like lies that people tell themselves mm. <clears throat> One of those is fake it till you make it. And really to shorten my, my answer to that is you need to find mentors when you're young. If you're in your 20s, that's the time to learn. That's the time to grow. It's not the time to, you know, make a million bucks and buy a Lamborghini and look like a moron. Right. right. It's really establishing yourself in a career path. So if you go to work for somebody and you're just honest with them and be like, hey, I'm going to be the most resourceful person that you ever hire. Mm. It's almost like Tom Brady, right? Walks up to Robert Crowd the very first day be this is the best decision you've ever made. It's because he just worked hard and became who he was. Right. And that's really the principle that I think people need to get. It's not about just fast cash and looking like you're wealthy on Instagram. It's really about establishing your processes and procedures and growing your, your net worth. Yeah, more people need to hear that because so many people want that fast cash and it, it rarely works out. Yeah. You know what I mean? The universe will punish you if you make it fast because usually when you're making it fast, it's a bit unethical mm -hmm. and you'll lose it pretty quick. Yeah, and you also don't appreciate it, right? So then you start doing dumb investments. You know, I see guys fifty thousand dollars here, hundred thousand dollars here. They don't know how to underwrite it. They don't have anyone advising them. Right. And you know, because they're making some good money, and then and then just the deck of cards falls. <laughs> <Absolutely>. <laughs> House of cards falls down. No, that happened to me. Honestly, I made a lot of in crypto very fast, yeah. and I was like, let me diversify. Let me invest in restaurants. Let me invest in AI. Let me invest in all this. Lost all of it. Yeah. Because when you invest in stuff you don't know about, it's hard. Yeah, I actually think diversification is another lie. Mm. Actually. It's very, you know, you take a mutual fund, right? It's got 1,500 stocks into it, right? Those things do not do well right. over the long term. It's much better for you to go pick three winners and just ride them all the way. Wow. So you're not a fan of investing in the S&P 500 every year? No. Well, there's two lines of thought there, right? <clears throat> if you are 
an intelligent investor? Absolutely not. But if you're running your business and you're growing an asset class and you don't have time to really look into stocks, mm. then yeah, you can buy the S&P, right. <clears throat> which I was, I, you know, index funds is where I'd go for that. Yeah. Do you invest in those, uh, what are they called? It's like f- treasuries or whatever, like 5% a year, too low for you? I don't touch bonds. I don't touch treasuries. Right. I, um, yeah, I'm just, I've been, I started investing on it when I was 21. Wow. So I have a massive runway. And so it's like, no, I'd rather take more risk now. And, and, it, and it's worked out, you know, I've been mean, able to buy Apple and Google and, and not that I'm some genius. Anyone looking back in time can sound like a genius. I bought <laughs> Apple, you know, ten years ago. I just knew it was a good company. And so ten I years just, ago, you knew. Oh, I've been, oh yeah, I've Before been buying. When the iPhone came out. Um, no, well, that was 2008. <clears throat> so um, probably about 2010, 2012 was when I really started going heavy into Apple. Got it. Wow. Yeah. So to have that foresight, do you think it's just being around the right people, reading certain websites? What do you think caused that? So I was a Warren Buffett guy. I okay. studied Warren Buffett the way. So when I was in college, college was really easy for me, and so. Um, I just studied a lot of Warren Buffett and how value investing. Mm. And so I just looked at companies that I think are great. And then that's where I put my money. I mean, I do a little bit of underwriting. You know, I want to make sure that they can grow and that their top line revenue can grow and stuff yeah. like that. But really, at the end of the day, I just go, is this a great company? I'll invest in it. And I look, I, I'm a 10 year, 15 year horizon guy. So Got I don't, it. I put it in and almost set it and forget it. Wow. I wish I did that with Shopify. <clears throat> I bought Shopify in college. And if I still had it now, you know, it's oh, like yeah. worth millions. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I think people think like, oh, let me flip this within a week. You know? Yeah, and I've had some misses, right? Tesla was a major miss for me. I don't, I have, I don't know, maybe ten grand in Tesla, mm. just because it got really, really expensive and the PE ratio got wild. I, was, right. I think it was like twelve hundred. Mm. And so, um, but yeah, you know, fifteen or not fifteen, probably eight, nine years ago when Tesla kind of started getting hot, that'd have been a perfect time to jump in. But I'm also a dollar cost average guy. Once I start buying a stock, I normally buy it up to like five years, right? And then once it gets to a certain level, I kind of leave it. Do you dabble with any crypto? I do, yeah. <laughs> I tell people not to just because you got to understand the blockchain to understand cryptocurrency, right? right. <clears throat> and so, um, but yeah, I, I, I have like 14 miners. and Oh, wow. Bitcoin yeah, or Ethereum? Uh, I was doing Ethereum to begin with, you know, wow. but then they lost their minds and went yeah, to yeah. proof of stake or whatever it is. And then uh, most, most of my, almost 90% of my crypto is all in Bitcoin. Nice. Um, you had an interesting take regarding goals. So you posted, never tell anyone your real goals until you accomplish them. Mm-hmm. Why do you feel that way? Because it's a dopamine hit. So dopamine is the uh, enemy to success. Mm. And that is, and if anyone doesn't know what dopamine is, dopamine is a, is a, is a rush that your body, is a chemical that your body releases on the anticipation of a reward. And so marketing is all dopamine, right? You're going to get this thing or something cool. And, you know, luxury brands really play on your dopamine. And what happens is once you have that dopamine hit, it actually like slows you down and you wow. kind of get like a, an elation to it instead of just like grinding, 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 grinding. Mm. And when I say grinding, what I actually mean is being disciplined. You know, the way you lose weight, the way that you build businesses, it's disciplined, right? Because you do the same thing every single day, no matter what. Right. It's a big thing. I mean, I'm sure you know who Alex Ramosi is. Yeah. Right? So I've been following Alex for a while. I, he's one of my, there's very few social media influencers I follow. And he, to me, he's like the king right now. Agreed. Because he just, he gets it. And, he, and he, he did it the right way. He just builds and builds and builds and builds. And there's not a lot of emotion to it. There's just, I know what works. And even him himself, he talks about the three things he does really, really well. And you just hire everything else out. Yeah. He's very similar to myself. Speaking of discipline and weight loss, you lost 65 pounds. You sent me a photo of you before. I couldn't even recognize yeah. it. <laughs> I'm actually up to 70 now. Wow. Yeah, I've got another 15 pounds to lose. It was kind of funny. I, I was I, uh, in our men's group last year. I, we did a UFC kind of training where, you know, we were like kind of wrestling each other and fighting. And yeah. I realized that day, I'm like, dude, I am not as fit as I think I could be. And so mm. I'm six foot seven, tall like you. I was 344 pounds at the time. And, Damn. And the next day I just said, never again. And I just started a diet. And then I've had little things along the way that have actually kind of steroids shot me, not actually doing steroids, but like <laughs> gave me, a, you know, some more encouragement. Like Jimmy and I were actually talking one time, Jimmy Rex, uh, who's the, the leader of We Are The They, and it's his group. Yeah good friend of mine and I basically said dude I'm the most disciplined dude you've ever met and he looked at me and I knew it was coming right and he said well you know look at your look at your body essentially right mm. and at that point I'd actually been working out for about six or seven weeks and I lost about two pounds and it was wow. mentally hard right to like just go to the gym every day eat I ate 250 grams of protein damn backfill my calories and and it was just really really hard and so the, but that was a moment where I was like you know he's right like I need to really really never stop doing this and then, um, and then Andy Frazilla actually had this thing where he says, when a fit person walks into a room, everyone notices mm. and they respect them automatically. And, and I was watching that, you know, just on Instagram, I was like, dude, this dude's right. 
Like every time a super fit person walks in the room, I just there's just an instant amount of respect. Facts. Yeah, because it takes years to get to that physique, so you respect it. It does, and there's no cheating. No, you, you know, can't. My, yeah, you can't fake it. One of my best friends is a plastic surgeon, right? So I can have plastic surgery done anytime I want, and mm-hmm. it's like you you actually just can't get there unless you do it. I'm not a fan of uh, cosmetic procedures, actually. Yeah. Yeah, like even on girls, like I, I just don't like it. Yeah. How do you feel about them? Are you interested in coming on the Digital Social Hour podcast as a guest? We'll click the application link below in the description of this video. We are always looking for cool stories, cool entrepreneurs to talk to about business and life. Click the application link below and here's the episode, guys. You know, I've got a bunch of different opinions on that, really. (laughs) (laughs) Um, There's a confidence thing with, speaking specifically women, um, I think it's best for people to have a certain amount of confidence as long as it's real confidence. And if the only way for that person to get there is through plastic surgery, I'm okay, I'm okay with it. It's probably a good thing, really. Not even that I'm okay with it. Mm. Do I like the plastic looks? No. Do I think facial stuff looks good? No. <laughs> I'm not a big fan of big fake lips either. I mean, that's me personally, right? right? Now, does that woman look beautiful in some points? Yeah. And, it, and if it makes her really feel better and she's increased her quality of life, then I say that's a good thing for you. Right. I can respect that. I just mean from purely the health aspect. Like, you don't know what, like, the plastic. Like, you see the boob ones, like, the thing breaks, and then they almost die. Yeah, yeah. So it's just... No, my wife has implants, and uh, she's had them redone, and one of them had it actually ruptured. Wow. And so... But it's it's a maintenance thing. Once you do it, man, you have to always do it. That's true, yeah. But in in regards to her, she's kind of a good example. She started working out really, really hard when we first got married. I've almost been married 20 years. Hmm. And she lost them all. They went down to an A cup. And it was making her feel... Wait, from working out? Yeah. I didn't know that was a thing. Yeah, because they're, they're just fat, basically, right? So ah. the more lean you get, the flatter they get. And, Interesting. And so she, wanted, she did fitness competitions. And so she, she wanted them. We talked about it. We you know, bought them, and she's, she's had them. It's made her, and it makes her feel more feminine. Yeah, that makes sense to yeah. me. Yeah. Um, speaking of marriage, 20 years, rare these days. Oh, Talk yeah. to me about that journey and how you were able to make it work. Yeah, so, so to be fair, 20 years hits in June. So it seems to be smooth sailing. I think I it. <laughs> um, you know, I, I really, I got lucky. In some aspects, I married my best friend. Um, we've done everything together. We've got three kids together. She's still my best friend. Mm-hmm. Um, I love and respect her more than any person on this planet. Um, it's, it's interesting, right? Being married for 20 years, like you learn different stages of love, you know? Right. And that's the reason why I say I got lucky because I didn't love my wife the way I love her now. Wow. Because I've gone through so many things with her, right? I've watched her. I've watched her be disciplined. I've watched her birth three children, raise three kids. We homeschool, so she homeschools our kids. Mm. I just, I, almost every day, and this will sound cliche or romantic, I just l- I almost fall in love with her again every day because wow. I just respect the person that she is, and I get a front row to her all the time. That's, that's beautiful. And the thing with uh, relationships, I'm in a six-year one. You know, you change a lot in those years. Yeah. And you weren't the same guy when you met her. So yeah. I think just evolving together and just constantly communicating helps yeah. a lot as well. And she really helped me in, through my 20s, right? I got married at 22, she was wow. 20. We were wildly young. <laughs> yeah, that's super young. But you know, like all the business, all the times I was gone, flying all over the country, meeting people, fixing things I was breaking, building companies, like she was at home holding it down, mm. right? Just, you know, she, I, was, I always feel love when I come home. My, my home to me, I would call it my castle, is like my peace. So when I go home, I get filled with all this peace and, and it's gentle there and there's a lot of love. Then I go back out into the world and just kind of, you know, fight or grind or whatever you want to call it. Right. It, just, it brings a lot of like, you know, energy. To yeah, you. same. And that's so important, right? It took yeah. me years to get to that point. And um, I think a lot of guys, you know, that are single, they're, they're really missing that in their life. 100%, yeah. And but you, you will make much more money if you're a married man. Agreed. And yeah. it's a common thing these days to be single uh, and, and the numbers keep increasing. So it's yeah. a little scary to, to see the family unit being broken up. Yeah, we'll see how it goes. We'll see. I don't <laughs> think it can keep going that way for long. Yeah. Um, speaking of family though, three kids, Yep. what went into that decision in regards to homeschooling? Yeah. So when hit, um, you know, we had, the kids had to come home with me for three or four months or something like that. Yeah. And actually my little, my little boy, nicest kid you've ever met, couldn't read. He was in second grade. Now teachers kind of passed over him cause he's very kind mm. right? and he's very fun and people love him. Right. So he would just memorize a couple of words and really couldn't read. So as we were doing homeschool and my wife is very academic, she grows up in a very academic family. Right. And uh, she just was like, hey, our Nixon can't read. You know, I don't think these kids are doing that well. She's like, what do you think if I homeschooled them for a year? Mm. And my honest first reaction to that was like, oh, are you sure? Because <laughs> like, that's like a lot of time yeah, and a lot yeah. of energy. And, you know, I mean, she, she's, a, she's a homemaker, right? So she can do whatever she wants all day. She doesn't have a job. And, mm-hmm. and I just said, yeah, honey, if you, if you want to do it, 
you know, I'll support you 100 percent in that. You know, and it's actually expensive to do it because we don't get any kickbacks from the state, and mm. we still pay our property tax you right. know, for all that for the general fund. And um, I always just said to her, I'm like, hey, if it ever gets too much, we'll just pop them in school. No harm, no shame. Mm. And um, and our kids have just really, really, really excelled. And wow. We also look at it as a blessing too because when you have kids, right, you know that they're eventually going to leave. Little kids love you. Or they're all over you, right? And they just, they're happy to see dad and mom and all this kind of stuff. And so instead of shipping them off for eight hours now, she actually gets to be with them all day. Mm. She only does school for four, but she gets to actually spend all this time with them. And I just, as I'm looking down the road, I just like, this is going to pay so much dividends in the relationship and the, and I, I tell my kids all the time too, I'm like, you need to be grateful that you're not going to public school, that you have your mom who loves you that's sitting here teaching you and you're getting a great education at the same time. Right. Yeah. Public school was an interesting journey for me. I feel like the one thing I didn't like was everyone learns at the same rate. Mm -hmm. So like I listen to podcasts and audiobooks at 2x, 2.5x, yeah. and I'm just a fast learner. And I feel like just being, I almost felt trapped, you know what I mean? In certain yeah. classrooms, because I was just so jittery. I'm like, oh, I already know this. Like, And I feel like it holds you back in a way. Oh, 100%. My My... My junior and senior year in high school, I did nothing. You know, I was like a TA for my coach because I played football. Yeah, I, I took stupid classes, right? I, I sloughed all the time, and I still graduated with like a 3.9 GPA, 3.8 GPA. It, I mean, it's just if, as long as you hand your homework in, right, there's no big deal. And yeah. so, you know, I look at public school, and, I, and public school is not good. And I don't care if that offends people. It's just not. It's one of the, it's one of the programs in our country that really needs to be revamped. Agreed. And part of it's that, right? Like, why don't we take our best learners and accelerate them? Yeah. And turn them into the, the future engineers and doctors and scientists and, you know, the things that actually make our society much better. And it used to be that, right? My dad skipped two grades, but when I was in school, that wasn't an option anymore. Yeah. And I feel like, I mean, years were wasted, let's be honest. I mean, there's nothing of substance that we learn there that we still use to this day, other than, like, networking, maybe. Yeah, 100%. And college and university is almost as bad. The first yeah. two years are like your last two years of high school. <laughs> because people don't get that college really is a business. You know, I, and I sit on boards in colleges. I've, I've, I've done a lot of work. I donate money to colleges and kids' education. Wow. And I'm not saying education's bad. I'm just saying that even university now, I mean, the ROI is horrible, right? You get a liberal arts degree and even half the business degrees, your ROI is just not there. Right. And yeah, I like that you said they're a business because they are making billions of dollars. <laughs> yes, they are. <laughs> off those tuitions. I mean, 50K a year, some of these colleges, it's crazy. Yeah. And the ROI, I mean, the professor's salary is probably 100, 200K. So right. they're making a ton of profit. Oh, absolutely. And then they get, you know, the, the state all gives them grants, you know, and some of the big schools like Harvard, I mean, I, I can't remember what the number is, like a $40 billion, you know, whatever that their pot of money is. Yeah. You know? It's it's crazy. Your story is interesting, though, because you, you were on the football team, you were really good in school, and you're good in business. I've never seen like that mix of athleticism, yeah. you know, school <laughs> smarts and street smarts. Well, my football career ended in high school, but yeah. Um, and the reason why is I actually, I used to be an LDS, a member of the Mormon Church, you know, Church of Jesus Christ, Latter-day Saints, they've changed, or they've gone to the full name now. Mm -hmm. And when I was on my mission in Scotland, I actually broke my back. Damn. And so when I came home, it kind of ended that. And so I, I really poured into school after that and, and my career. I was actually going to be an attorney. Wow. And so I got into law school. I was going to go to Texas Tech. And then my dad came to me and said, hey, I want you to help me run the family business. And I wasn't loving – well, I didn't do very well in the LSAT. Okay. And so – and, you know, being a white kid, you know, you just don't get ranked that well in these schools. And so I didn't want to go do the – the partnership grind of 80 hours a week. And so I decided to stay at my parents' company for a little while, and then I ended up buying it. Nice. Everything happens for a reason, right? Yeah. How'd you break your back? Dunking a basketball. Oh, or try, really? Attempting to dunk on a, over somebody. It was just yeah. a nasty fall. Trying to pull a Vince Carter. Yeah. yeah. What really happened was is years and years of football training had weakened my discs. And so when I went and I rimmed out on this dunk, and it, um, it just ruptured a disc in my back. Yeah, I'm in a couple leagues now. I, I don't play as aggressive as I want to just for that reason. Because yeah. the more you drive and dunk and – just the risk for injury is too high. And when you're in the air that high, I mean. People... Well, especially not when you're playing outside of organized stuff, right? You got, right. <laughs> just dudes are going to take your legs ball. out and just stupid stuff. Yeah, they don't care about you. <laughs> um, going back to the Mormon stuff, you left the church, right? I did, yeah. Yeah, I left the church like 14, 15 years ago. Really what that was is um, the way that I grew up was wonderful. Right? I grew up in a very safe place, very highly concentrated LDS members. Um, I got married in the temple to my wife, which is a thing in the Mormon culture. Mm -hmm. And then uh, once my wife got pregnant, my, our values just didn't quite align with the church anymore. And I really look at the church as a stepping stone. Right. Um, I, had no, I hold no animosity towards the church. A lot of people leave the church and they're mad. They feel like they've been bamboozled or something. Right, right. Or, and, you know, I mean, look at marketing. You know, you've, you've been tricked into buying all sorts of stuff your whole life. That's mm -hmm. kind of how I view it. So for me, when I left the church, I basically just flipped a light switch and but I mean, I still I have a contract with the LDS Church. Like we, I still do business with them. Oh, nice. The community that I live in is 
full of LDS members. We're all friends. Among, we're all, you know. So it wasn't each. really like frowned upon when you left? Um, yeah, yes and no. Most of the members are a little confused, right? Because I was, I was a good member. I did what they asked me to do and, and that kind of stuff. And my parents still have a, have a little bit of an issue with it. I don't know to what extent. My siblings are fine with it. All my friends are fine with it now. But in, in my opinion, the church is having a little bit of a mass exodus. Mm. Kid, people that are 40 and under, you know, I don't, they don't, don't really report their numbers, but they, uh, there's not a lot. Of, the membership's definitely going down. You aren't the first guest that has left that church on the show. I'm sure, yeah. So, yeah, it's, it's, and that's with religion in general, I'm seeing with uh, millennials, Gen X. It, they don't seem to be as passionate as the older generations. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, to me, religion historically, and it, it was kind of a way to control people. And I don't even know if that was a good or a bad thing. You know, right. there's a lot of uneducated people, you know, back in the 1200s, 1300s. And so I just kind of feel like religion was used as a tool to control people or control society at some level and yep. keep people good. But, yeah, I mean, I think nowadays there's so many people can – you access information on their phone. I mean, it's just it's just too easy to like really understand how history and religion is all tied into each other. Now, you, you know, we get one life, right? You got to live it the way that you want. Yeah, yeah, it's so easy with the access to information. There's just one YouTube channel. I think it's called like Growing Up Scientology. Have oh you, wow, yeah. Have yeah. you seen that one? I haven't seen that, but I've watched Going Clear a few times. The yeah, HBO doc. I mean, he just really exposes the Scientology uh, religion. It's, yeah. it's fascinating. And when I was in LA, I actually got pulled by one of the Scientology guys. I had no idea it was Scientology. Oh, really? Yeah, he walked me inside. I signed up, and I was like, what is this? Oh, you signed up? You yeah, mean? he got me. I had no <laughs> idea. It was crazy. But, yeah, this guy just stands outside his building and just exposes them. Yeah. It's interesting, but I don't know. I, I kind of just studied different religions and spiritualities and just formed my own opinion. Yeah, so where, you, where do you sit on it? I, I would say I'm just spiritual. You yeah. know what I mean? I believe there's a soul. I believe there's a greater purpose. Yeah. yeah. I think where I'm at right now is I went atheist for a while, actually, when Same. I left the church. You know, and mostly because i just felt like i needed to reset everything that i feel i grew up that way right so when you, you don't really know what's right or left when you leave right and so but now i, I really just i just hope that there's a god i just mm. hope that i can be with my friends and family into the eternities right it just feels a little empty that if we just die then it's over I, I, that's how i used to believe i do believe there is an afterlife yeah yeah i, I really hope there is I yeah mean, it'd be kind of bad if there was in my opinion yeah or it won't matter, right? Because you're deaf. <laughs> yeah. Do you ever think about legacy, like your kids, like providing for them when you're gone? Hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. I uh, what I do for my legacy with my kids is I've been paying them as employees, right, for a long time, and they do certain things for me, Instagram models, right. and whatever, whatever. And so I've been building a stock portfolio for them mm. for years and years and years. My kids are 14, 12, and eight. Now. Wow. And so when they turn 16, they'll actually start coming to work with me every day and doing school from home. Or from work mm. and I will teach them how to grow businesses and real estate and all these kind of things through my employees and basically doing the mentor thing that I tell everybody to do. I'm going to, I'm going to force that with my kids cause I can. Right? Mm. And then hopefully I will, I will eventually turn over their net worth to them when they're responsible enough to do it. Interesting. Cause to me, net worth is more important than how much cash you earn in a year, right? It's, it's growing assets. It's looking at the different asset classes and seeing what you're good at and then playing in those arenas and really growing that over the years. Right. I love that because money cycles every uh, three generations, I believe. So the fact that you're doing this with your kids, hopefully their kids won't lose the money. You know what I mean? Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Because that's definitely concerning when I, because uh, when rich people have kids, you know, the daddy's money kids, it doesn't always end up well. Oh, no. You know, the trust fund kids is a real thing. Yeah. And I, I, I've really looked at that because um, I'm not the guy that's going to donate all of his money to a charity at the end. My kids will get it all. Okay. Right? And um, I just, I just, I feel that my responsibility is to educate them in my way along that way. I right. Assume I'm going to live a long time, let's just say 80, right? So these kids should be 50, 50, 60 when they actually finally get that money. Right. But by then they should have so much of their own money, it won't matter. It'll just go, it'll just be more assets in their portfolio and yeah, and I'll be wherever I'm at. I love that. Uh, Mark, where can people find you, man, and what you're up to? So the place to find me is uh, on Instagram. Um, I'm President McCormack. Is uh, my handle on there. It's also my name of my podcast, the President McCormack Podcast. Um, feel free to reach out to me, and all my companies are listed on there. So if you need basketball hoops or floors or whatever, thanks. I'm going to get a hoop from you, man. Yeah, sounds good. Let's do it. Thanks for coming on, man. Thanks for watching, guys, and I'll see you tomorrow. Thank you. <laughs>